Here we are live. Okay, great. Okay, I think you can see my slide, right? Yes. Perfect. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our first background lecture in uh, PNS Modern SSDs. In this course, we will uh, provide some background information about SSDs and how NAND flash works, as well as some cutting edge uh, research in this direction. And also students uh, will do some hands-on projects. So this is uh, the first background lecture that we will cover some basics of NAND flash based SSDs. So in today, uh, Lecture, we will cover SSD organization and request handling, NAND flash organization and NAND flash operations. So as we, let me hide this. Yeah. So as we also uh, covered in the previous uh, meeting, the modern SSD is a complicated system that consists of multiple cores, hardware controllers, DRAM and NAND flash memory packages. So, so we see that uh, as an example, a PCB of a SSD, that it has like uh, eight NAND packages or NAND uh, flash chips. Each one has 128 gigabyte. And also we have a LPTDR DRAM to, for metadata and also other uh, important information, which is usually 0.1% uh, of the total capacity of the SSD. And the SSD controller is uh, consists of several cores. Here in this example, three cores. And uh, it has some hardware flash controllers to do request handling, ECC randomization, and encryption uh, NG. So let's uh, take a deeper look in this uh, SSD controller. So SSD controller has uh, different parts. The first part is host interface layer. Another step of uh, SSD controller, uh, controller is flash translation layer, which is, I guess, uh, we can consider as the most complicated part, FTL, which do uh, data cache management, address translation, garbage collection, rare labeling, and refreshing. And also some flash controllers to do ECC randomization and uh, control basically flash chips. And these uh, controllers are connected to NAND flash packages or NAND flash chips. So we also have a DRAM on PCB, which, do, which actually stores a host request queue, a write buffer, logical to physical mappings, and some metadata information. So let's uh, have a deeper, I mean, step-by-step -step look into this uh, organization. So the first, uh, so for the, for example, we start with the write request. So the first, the write request arrives in the host interface layer, HIL, which is uh, to communicate with the host operating system. And with a certain interface like SATA or NVMe that you may be aware of that, we will not uh, go in deep in, in these protocols, but let me know if you want to uh, have more information about these uh, interfaces so that we can cover it in later uh, lectures. And uh, a host IO request includes, you can imagine like uh, each request includes request direction, which is uh, could be read or write, offset, which is a start point for the sector, which is typically uh, 512 bytes each sector, and the size, which is uh, in, in number of sectors. So typically, uh, the offset and the size should be aligned by four kilobytes, which is, yeah, uh, it is a common practice. Then we have this uh, flash translation layer. The first part is uh, data cache management. Sorry, any question? 
Okay. By the way, uh, Rakesh, please uh, take a look at YouTube chat and let me know if there is any question. Thank you. So, so in DRAM, we have a write buffer, which is uh, really important to buffer data to write. So the goal of this write buffer is uh, one is to basically reduce the write latency. So as you as you may know, the write latency in SSDs is quite uh, long, which is a uh, kind of uh, hundreds of microseconds in modern SSDs, while the read latency is something like uh, tens of microseconds, which is kind of 70, 80, or something like that. So basically, writes are quite slow. And in order to accelerate uh, write accesses, it is important to have this write buffer. So basically, uh, when, when we have a write, we first SSD writes in the write buffer and sends acknowledge to the, to the whole system. And basically, yeah, backstaging uh, writes to the SSD happens in, I mean, yeah, in the background. So the first goal of this write buffer is to reduce the write latency. And also it can enable flexible IO scheduling. Basically, uh, it is important, for example, when we have a, we have reads and writes. So typically because reads are quite uh, fast, uh, are faster than writes in SSD. And, and actually reads are usually on the critical path of the execution of your application. So it is a common practice in SSDs that, for example, when we have a write, we can uh, preempt writes and do reads. So this write buffer can enable that. Basically, uh, you write your data in the, in the write buffer, and you can uh, go on and try to prioritize reads as much as possible. And once there is no read or ongoing reads, you can do in background the write request, which is, again, uh, can improve the Basically, yeah, your ex performance experience. And also write buffer can help to improve lifetime of SSD. So as we also discussed last, in the last meeting, uh, SSDs, uh, they have like, yeah, NAND flashes, they have uh, limited endurance, meaning that the number of program and array cycles is limited. So if you are uh, lucky enough, basically when you write the data in the write buffer, and you update that data one while the, your data is still ready in the write buffer. So basically, you don't need to write the, um, the stale data or the old data in the SSD. So you, you basically update your data in the write buffer, which uh, reduces the number of PE cycles. But this is not so likely because uh, the thing is that the, the locality in the SSD, the IO device is not. Uh, uh, so high because usually th those local localities uh, is captured uh, through the uh, caching system and also in OS level caching. But yeah, that is also can happen and provide better reliability and lifetime for SSDs. So the size of this uh, write buffer should be limited, which is usually tens of megabytes, which is uh, really important because uh, yeah, because SSD is kind of, you know, is a uh, non-volatile storage. So basically, if you have sudden power off, so your data should not be gone. You should have your data. So it is, uh, so usually SSD, they use some capacitors, which they have, they, uh, yeah, store some charges so that in those of, uh, when we, in the case of sudden power off, you can basically uh, de-stage your data in the write buffer to the SSD. So basically uh, your write buffer should be small enough so that your charge it can handle that de-staging process. So if you want to have a larger write buffer, basically you need to have uh, more capacitors, which in, indeed uh, can increase the cost of SSD. Any question for this part for the write buffer? Okay, so another uh, part of FTL is address translation. So as we also discussed briefly in the previous meeting, so in SSDs we cannot have, uh, it is not efficient to have in-place writes. 
so whenever you want to update uh, a page, you basically you you do out of place, right? So you find an, uh, a a page which is uh, erased before, and then you write to that page. So basically, you need some uh, mapping log uh, logic that maps your logical address space to physical address space. So is uh, uh, address translation part in FDA. And also we need to uh, store the mapping table in DRAM. This mapping table is stored in uh, DRAM, which usually, uh, yeah, consists of most of this DRAM space uh, allocates to this logical to physical mapping table. So mapping granularity is usually four kilobytes. Uh, although SSD page size usually is uh, 16 kilobytes, we do this fine grain mapping, uh, which we will cover later in our lectures. So we have a metadata for each four uh, kilobyte of your data. And for each four kilobyte, we have four bytes that, as you can see, that basically mapping uh, uh, table consists of 0.1% of SSD capacity. And as I said, most of this uh, DRAM capacity we allocate to this mapping table. So another operation of FDL is uh, garbage collection, uh, where leveling and refreshing. So garbage collection, as we also discussed previously, is to reclaim free pages. So at some point, then you don't have enough uh, number of free pages, or uh, uh, I mean, raised blocks. So basically, you need to erase some blocks to free more pages to to do this out of place right. So. To this end, garbage collector, it selects a victim block and uh, it copies all valid pages because your victim block can have some valid pages. So we need to copy all valid pages somewhere else. And then we need to erase the victim block and make it ready for uh, future operation. We will uh, actually cover garbage collector in a different lecture because it is quite important and, and one of the main bottleneck in SSD devices. So another operation is where leveling, which is important to evenly distribute P cycles across NAND flash blocks. So consider that you have some blocks which, which you do a lot of program and arrays. So they are kind of, you can consider them as, as a hot blocks that they have basically the endurance. You are uh, using a lot of P cycle on them. So, <clears throat> and also you, you can have some blocks that they are, they are cold meaning that the number of PE cycles for them is not too high. So basically it is important to swap uh, hot, hot and cold, basically to not allocate your uh, uh, pages to, to hot blocks as much as possible to try to basically even uh, the number of PE cycles. So where leveling is a technique uh, which uh, does that, but yeah, there are different algorithms uh, for that, that we will also cover uh, some of state of the art techniques in where leveling in our later uh, lectures. And data refreshing. So basically uh, SSD is a non-volatile memory, but the thing is that the retention time is not, uh, I mean, infinite. So at some uh, time after uh, like a year or two years or something like that. So your data uh, basically, uh, the, the NAND flash uh, cells, they, uh, yeah, they, uh, they, leaks, uh, they leak uh, charges. So you need to refresh pages to make sure that uh, your data is not gone and is not faulty. So it is not, uh, I mean, so frequent as we do in DRAM, but we need to do DRAM refreshing, uh, I mean, data refreshing in SSDs also after a year or after two years, something like that. So then we have this flash controller, which has a uh, do a randomization. So randomization is basically scrambling data to write, and which is important to avoid worst case data patterns that can lead to significant errors. Uh, we will cover actually randomization in, uh, in a lecture that we will go in deep to reliability issues of SSDs. And we have this error correcting codes, which uh, can detect and correct errors. Example, we can have 72 bits uh, per one kilobyte uh, error correction capability. So 
So again, basically you need to store some parity information together with your data to use these pieces. And then basically controller, they need to issue NAND flash comments to write your data. So for the read is the process is could be simpler. So when you want to read from flash, first checks if the rate uh, request data exists in the right buffer because so you already populate the right buffer with your writes. So when, whenever you have a read, you first need to check the right buffer that it may hit in the right buffer so that basically you quickly return the corresponding request. But if it's not hit, uh, then we need to basically go to the address translation. Also note that uh, a host read request can be involved with several pages. Not, uh, so when you read, uh, your read request could be a page, or uh, several pages. So basically a uh, request can be written only after all the requests that data is written. So if your data is not in data cache, then you need to do this address translation with logical to physical mapping to find the exact position in the physical and exact NAND flash uh, uh, yeah, pages that store your data. And then uh, with flash controller, uh, you can access your data. So you need to, after reading uh, your data from NAND flash package, you need to do uh, ECC and also de-randomize the right data. It is actually probable that your ECC decoding can fail, which is not uh, rarely happen. It is actually quite frequent, frequently happen. So your ECC decoding can fail. And then you need to retry reading of the page with adjusted uh, voltage reference voltage that we will cover what does it mean in the, this lecture. Okay, any question uh, before? Bahman, uh, there are two questions on YouTube. Yes, sure. Uh, sure. One question is how will the victim block be detected for garbage collection? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so uh, yeah, mm -hmm. please go ahead. Yeah, for, for, for that uh, victim block, uh, again, the, there should be different, uh, there are different uh, trade-offs and policies, but uh, you can assume that basically the blocks that, uh, as a very simple mechanism, you can assume that the blocks with uh, uh, minimum number of active, uh, yeah, uh, valid, sorry, the number of valid uh, pages could be a good candidate to consider. But basically, there are also other information, other uh, trade-offs to be considered as the bandwidth of the garbage collection and like the plane level parallelism that we will actually cover in detail in our uh, garbage collection lecture. Thank you. Uh, the second question is uh, how to refresh the NAND pages and uh, so how, what is the policy to refresh the NAND pages? Do we need to move the data from one block to another block to do that? Uh, it's so basically, basically data refresh. Yeah. Yeah. How we do that data refreshing? That's the yeah. question. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not actually completely sure that if we move the data to. Yeah. I think if we move the data to another block. We basically read the data and write it to another uh, free block. But maybe, Rakesh, if you can add better answer, I'm not completely sure. Yes. Uh, I agree with you, Mohammed. I think uh, the, the refresh. Uh, mechanism is basically reading the data from one block uh, and uh, moving it to another block. Exactly, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. Erasing the old block. Uh, so this is mainly done when there is a, when we see disturbances in the, in the data that uh, uh, because of retention effect or uh, some, dist some dist read disturbance impact also. So, yeah. Yeah, great, exactly. Okay, uh, thanks a lot. Those are very good questions. Um, any other questions from the Zoom attendees? Um, yes, could you maybe uh -huh. quickly summarize um, what exactly makes up a page? Uh, what exactly makes makes up page? How, how the page is organized, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Okay, we, we will actually cover it in this lecture uh, later. Uh, All yeah. right, great, thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay, uh, let's move on. So now we want to jump into NAND flash organization. 
So first, uh, let's take a look at the flash cell. So a flash cell, basically, it is a transistor, which uh, you may be aware of that. So in transistor, we have uh, basically uh, four terminals, which is a control, source, drain, and substrate. You can also consider the three terminals, but anyway. Uh, so whenever the voltage from the between the gate and source, which we call it uh, gate source voltage, is uh, the voltage that you drive between the gate and source is higher than uh, the threshold voltage, uh, then your transistor becomes on. And then you, you can basically drain uh, current from drain to source. Otherwise, your transistor is off. So when, when, when your uh, voltage, gate source voltage is higher than voltage threshold, the you can consider transistor as a resistor. So transistor actually, when they are on, they can have different uh, operation modes, but for our simplicity, I guess it's not so important for now. So you can consider it as a resistance. So when it is on, it's a resistor, and when it is off, you can consider it as an open switch. So the only difference that we have in flash cell is that they uh, they are kind of, uh, basically they are built with a special material, which we call it a floating gate or charge trap. So floating gate is yeah for two D NAND flash and charge trap for three D. So we mostly uh, cover two D structure in this lecture, but let me know later if you want to also take a look at three D structure of NAND flashes. So. In floating gate, it is a, a gate that plays between a normal gate and uh, the, the, the substrate. So the, the operation of floating gate is that it can hold electrons in a non-volatile manner. Basically, if you uh, move some electro, electron to the floating gate, those electrons can be there, can be uh, maintained there for a long time that you can consider as a non-volatile manner. But as I said, it is not uh, infinite <clears throat> retention time, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> so after, <clears throat> I'm sorry. So after uh, amount of, some amount of time, uh, uh, yeah, these cells can leak uh, the charge and your, basically your, uh, the, your flash cell cannot work properly anymore. So, and you need to refresh your data. So in order to charge a uh, whole electron in the, in, the, in the floating gate, you need to apply high voltage, which we call it a uh, program voltage. Consider, you can consider as a 20 volt, for example. And then there is a tunneling that move electrons to the floating gate. After uh, trapping or trapping electrons in the, in the floating gate, then the, the thing is that your threshold voltage becomes higher. So your flash cell can have normal threshold voltage if you don't do this programming. But when you do this programming and you trap electrons in the floating gate, your, uh, your flash cell, the threshold voltage of the flash cell becomes much higher which we can show it here in this figure as a uh, VTH prime. So in order to assess that your, uh, basically your flash chip is flash cell, uh, your flash cell is a program or not, basically you need to apply a reference voltage. So a reference voltage is, uh, is a voltage which is something between a threshold, I mean, nominal threshold voltage or uh, high threshold voltage, which happen after programming. So if you're, after applying a reference voltage, if you see that your transistor or your flash cell is uh, acting as a resistor, which means that your threshold voltage is nominal, then uh, basically your, uh, your flash cell is not programmed, which means that it is stayed in the ar arrays, um, I mean, case. But if your transistor works as an open switch, which means that your threshold voltage is higher than the reference voltage, which means that you already programmed this uh, flash cell. Any question about uh, this uh, phenomena? Okay, great. 
So typically, uh, when when the when we don't program FlyCell, we consider it that uh, it stores one, and when we program it, we consider that it stores zero. But this is a kind of I mean uh, some contract, so you can also change it. But I mean usually it is the common practice. Okay, so in order to erase basically your flash uh, cell, you need to again move your electron to the substrate. To do that, basically you need to apply reverse voltage. Basically, you need to uh, apply minus twenty volts uh, to move your electrons to the substrate and make it uh, basic. And then your voltage threshold becomes nominal again. Great. So some important characteristics of flash cell is that we can have multi-level. A flash cell can store multiple bits. So one flash cell, when we program it, we basically we inject all the tunnel uh, electrons to the floating gate. And when we erase it, we basically we eject electrons. So if you do this uh, basically programming in more uh, accurate way, you can consider that you have four levels. And based on your charge or the number of electrons that you trap in the floating gate, you can uh, basically yeah uh, translate it to uh, two bits or three bits or four bits. So with this, uh, we can say that basically uh, this is the this is the, the reason that we can have multi-level cell in, in flash chips, flash cells. And we have a retention loss, as I said, a cell leaks electrons over time. So meaning that, for example, in, in this MLC two-bit multi-level cell example, after a year, you may reduce, lose some charges. So basically still you can, uh, so your data was uh, one zero. After a year, still you can read it one zero, but you can see that basically, uh, your charge is uh, reducing. And at some point after another year, for example, <clears throat> then your charge becomes less than the appropriate margin. And then basically you will read zero, zero instead of one zero, which is retention error. So to avoid that, we need to uh, refresh our data. And also another characteristic is limited lifetime that a cell wears after, uh, wears out after a number of PE cycle. So it happens actually, it, it has a bad effect on retention error, basically. So when you're basically in, in a nominal number of PE cycles, consider like you have 1000 PE cycles per year. So you, you will have uh, some retention loss, but still your data mm, can be recovered correctly. But if you do uh, a lot of peace cycles in that year, for example, 10,000, then you will uh, lose a lot of charge, which you will have retention error. Basically, the number of peace cycles can exacerbate the, the problem of retention error, and you will lose your data much, uh, uh, much faster. And to avoid that, basically, you need to refresh your data sooner, more frequently, and at some point, basically, after a uh, number of these cycles, basically your data, your flash cell cannot be store, cannot store data correctly, and you cannot work uh, with that. Okay. Any question about these characteristics? Okay. So <clears throat> let's uh, take a look now at the. So now we know the NAND flash cell. Let's see what is NAND string. So multiple NAND fl uh, multiple flash cells they uh, that are serially connected to a bit line uh, they call it we call it NAND string. So you can consider that like one twenty eight flash cells are serially connected here. So this is a uh, I assume that this is your targeted cell that you want to read data. Other cells you need to basically drive them with the pass voltage, which is a quite uh, high to make sure that those transistors uh, works as a resistor. No matter that you basically 
no matter if they are erased or programmed, meaning that no matter uh, what is the value of the threshold voltage. Basically, this uh, v, v pass is higher than uh, both threshold voltages. And for target set, basically, uh, we need to uh, apply different uh, voltage to, to write or read that we will cover later. So you can see actually the uh, this NAND string exactly it looks like as a NAND uh, gate in in I mean in uh, logic circuits. If you are familiar with, for example, with CMOS technology or I don't know other uh, pseudo NMOS technology. Basically, if you want to implement NAND gates, you need to serially connect the NMOS transistors. So here you can see that basically NAND string is also serially connected flash cells. So that's the main reason that we call it NAND flash. And a large number of cells um, could be like, uh, yeah, more than a uh, hundred thousand cells. They can work, operate concretely. So we basically, we have different, uh, more than uh, 100,000 100, bit lines that they are they can work uh, in, in parallel and we collect the the word line for each row they uh, basically it drives all the bit, uh, bit lines in one row that uh, you can uh, yeah they they can work in parallel and this is one of the main reasons that uh, flash uh, cells flash chips they provide high bit level parallels so a page is basically one row of this structure. So all of these, uh, yeah, basically the flash cells that they uh, place in, in a one row, uh, they, uh, they, yeah, they consist of one page. And they are kind of, basically they are driving different bit lines. So page is typically uh, 16 kilobyte, but we need to also store more bits for metadata, which would be parity for ECC or also other metadata information. Typically, uh, SSDs also they are they could be MLC, as I said. So you can uh, store multiple pages in one page in one word line, let's say. So yeah, for example, if you have two bit multiple level set, you can have two pages. So, and, and typically, uh, usually uh, people say that LSV page or MSV page in, in one word line. And uh, a block is, uh, consists of several pages that you can see here that, for example, yeah, all the, these, uh, yeah, each, each NAND strings that they are connected to, uh, each NAND string connects to one bit line, and these bit lines are connected in a row. So all of these together, they build a block. So if you want to calculate the number of pages that one block can store, you need to basically multiply the number of volt lines to the number of bits per cell, that then you have these, uh, the number of pages. Any question here? Yes, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes, sure. Uh, how do you, uh, I see that all the gates uh, of a single page uh, are connected together. How can you uh, program a single uh, transistor in that case if all the gates are connected? So uh, all the gates are connected, which means that uh, basically uh, when you want to program, you need to apply a voltage program. But in order to write zero or one, uh, you, you need to handle that with the bit line voltage that we will cover actually in this lecture. Uh, All right. Okay. So yeah, let's uh, have a conclusion here. Basically program and arrays, as I said, they are unidirectional, meaning that when you program a cell, you need to increase the voltage threshold. And when you erase the cell, you need to decrease the cell voltage. And programming a page cannot change zero cells to one cell, meaning that you need to first, you need to basically erase before write. And that's the main reason that we cannot do, uh, it's not efficient to do in place write. Uh, and erase unit is uh, happens 
in blood um, granularity. So to basically to increase the array's bandwidth. And as I said, basically, uh, in order to have in place right, uh, we need to erase the whole block. So we need to basically move all of these uh, valid pages to, a D, to the DRAM, erase the block, and then write back the whole data. So in order to hide that latency, we usually do, we erase block in the background using a garbage collector. And whenever we want to write the data, we do out of place, right? That we, yeah, basically we write on a, uh, on a page that is erased before. Okay, and then uh, an, another uh, level of NAND flash is planes. So a large number of blocks that they share bit lines, the, they, they are placed in a plane. So that could be like thousands of blocks. So here in this example, you can see that, for example, we have, uh, yeah, uh, 2K blocks. And uh, yeah, basically each, all of these blocks, uh, they share bit lines. So in order to basically, to be able that you uh, manage which NAND string, NAND, NAND string is going to access or drive the bit line, you, people, I mean, they add some transistors to, the, to each NAND string, two transistors per NAND string, which we use them to enable that NAND string to be connected to bit line. So, Usually we, so basically we want to enable one NAND string. Uh, so those transistors becomes on for that block. And for other uh, blocks, those transistors becomes off as a, uh, yeah, open switch. When we basically we apply a uh, low voltage to their gates. Any question for planes? Okay, and uh, a, a die contains multiple planes. Typically, it could be like uh, two to four planes. So here is an example, uh, like in, in a flash die in 21 nanometer. So you can see it has uh, four planes, and we have page buffer, which is uh, used to store temporary data, read data, or the data that we want to write, and some peripheral circuits to communicate with the flash controller. So you can see that uh, we have some row and column decoders that they are for each four planes, but planes basically share these uh, row and column decoders. So basically you have this plane level parallels, yeah, which means that you can access or write or read uh, planes in parallel, but it is a bit of one constraint that your address should be I mean, they, they should be in same uh, word line ops, which is because of these uh, row and column decoders that they share together. So, but yeah, please do not confuse this with the uh, flash chips and packages. So basically after, uh, so each uh, flash packages has, uh, or flash chip has several, can have several dice, uh, could be one, two, four dice, and each die has some planes. So DOIs actually, they can uh, operate in parallel. There is no uh, dependency in that sense in between DOIs in a NAND flash chips and packages. Okay, any question about the organization? So if I want to summarize uh, NAND flash, basically each NAND flash package uh, can have uh, several DOIs could be like one, two, four dice. And each die can have uh, two to four planes. Each planes have many blocks and each block has many uh, pages. Okay. So, yeah, I like to cover also NAND flash operation, but the thing is that we also need to discuss some projects. So maybe uh, we can discuss NAND flash operation in the in the next meeting. And now we uh, go over the project. What do you think? Yes, it will be fine. Great. So, so uh, what, uh, 
So there is a uh-huh. question on YouTube. Uh, this is yeah. slightly from the uh, from the initial slide. So the question is how how is the logical to physical mapping persisted uh, in the FTL? Uh, how uh, logical and physical mapping? What? Yeah. How how is the logical to physical mapping uh, stored in the in the SSD controller? Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, basically the question is about uh, how the, how the, this mapping table would slot, right? Mm-hmm. So very stored. It, yeah. So it, it is uh, stored in uh, in DRAM, but uh, we should also have a basically mapping table in SSD. But uh, but but when the SSD is working, basically the mapping table comes into the DRAM to make sure that you can have fast uh, address translation. Because if you don't have that mapping table inside your data, whenever you want to read the data, you need to first access mapping table uh, places in, in SSD, which can which is stored in uh, NAND uh, chips. And then you need to basically, yeah, you need to do first one read to understand uh, your translation. And then based on that, you need to do another. Uh, read operation. So basically, each uh, read access to uh, SSC could be again could be two uh, read accesses, which is not good. So because of that, we store NAND flash uh, this address translation inside DRAM to basically accelerate read process. But how we uh, basically how this mapping table looks like and uh, the entries that we have, we will cover it later in our later lectures. Was that good, Rakesh? Yes, thanks. Yeah. Sure. So yeah, uh, to to the live audience, uh, we will uh, continue our lectures uh, on, uh, next week about these NAND flash operations and how basically uh, yeah a lot of details about how we uh, write to NAND flash cells, how we read it, and also these. Uh, uh, sensing circuitry in that flash. So, but yeah, for this lecture, I think uh, this is the end of thing. Uh, thank you for all uh, live audience. So I'm going to stop live streaming now. <laughs>